This evening, we're celebrating the Parish Purgatorial Society Mass, praying for the souls inscribed in the Purgatorial Society, because next Friday would be Good Friday, and there is no Mass. So this evening, this Mass is offered for the souls of Ludovico and Fanny Tutoni, Jack and Rose Pidoni, Marsha Paul, Virginia and James Casenza, Veronica and Frank Scollins, deceased members of the Purcell family, Helen Ryle, Gregory Nordis, Anne-Marie McCann, Maria and Michael Estella, Corrine Fabris, Joseph Ferrara, Gerard Hess, Dr. Michael Morelli, deceased members of the Arroyo Tilfez, Mazza, Rivera, Vega, and Massanet Ortiz families, deceased members of the Antonisi family, deceased members of the Bracha family, deceased members of the Graciolo, Vanier, and Michio families, deceased members of the Castro and Soberano families, deceased members of the Conry, D'Angelo, Massey, and O'Sullivan families, deceased members of the Cook, McGinty, Neenan, and O'Shea families, deceased members of the Daniello family, deceased members of the Gambecki family, deceased members of the Geraci and Petrolo families, deceased members of the Krauss and Gallinaro families, deceased members of the McAllister family, deceased members of the Melfin family, deceased members of the Moroni and Glynn families, deceased members of the Polella and Romano families, deceased members of the Ramirez family, deceased members of the Sladich, Hackett, Wilbrett, and Beloga families, deceased members of the Tierney family, deceased members of the Wagner, Lasky, and Panino families, deceased members of the Whitbread, Bain, and Goodwin families, Bruno Bassiati, Nancy and Walter Berry, Margie and Jim Cinelli, Mary Coleman, Peter Corrielli, Allison Criswell, Stephen Crowley, Father James DeVita, Jean Dugan, Betty Dunwoody, Donald Jean Ducher, Jose Manuel Estevez, John Patrick Gleason, Joan Greco, Bill Krause, Josephine Harris, Robin Lane, Wendy Lippo, Bobby and Charlie Luisi, Robert J. Nayer, Billy Massonet, Luis E. Massonet, Charlie Martino, Alva and Ralph Mazza, Grace McQuaid, Rosa Jack Moran, Brian Nordis, Carol Patitucci, Gloria Reyes Oliver, Edward and Laurie Ramelcamp, Edward Reap, Walter and Edna Reap, Peter Reyes, William Riano, Steve Reed, Walter and Ethel Reed, Kenneth and Mary Reed, Gus Ruscio, Steve Schmidt, Jason John Serrano, Ricky, Rick, and Irma Tice, Agnes and Nick Volpe, Betty and Caesar Volpe, Lucy and Frank Volpe, Robert Volpe. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And with your spirit. Brethren, let us acknowledge our sins and so prepare ourselves to celebrate the sacred mysteries. I confess, yes. to Almighty God. God. And, and to you, my brothers, brothers and sisters, sisters, that, that I have greatly sinned in my thoughts, in my words, in what I have done, and what I have failed to do, through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. Therefore, I ask the blessed Mary, ever virgin, all the angels and saints, and you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me to the Lord, Lord our God. God. So may Almighty God have mercy on us. Forgive us our sins. Bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Amen. Kyrie eleison. Kyrie eleison.
Christe eleison. Christe eleison. Kyrie eleison. Kyrie eleison. Let us pray. Pardon the offenses of your people, we pray, O Lord, that in your goodness set us free from the bonds of sin we may commit in our weakness. We ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in unity of the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. Amen. <clears throat> The first reading is from the Old Testament prophet Jeremiah. I hear the whisperings of many, terror on every side. Denounce, let us denounce him. All those who were my friends are on the watch for any misstep of mine. Perhaps he will be trapped. Then we can prevail and take our vengeance on him. But the Lord is with me, like a mighty champion. My persecutors will stumble and will not triumph. In their failure, they will be put to utter shame, to lasting, unforgettable confusion. O Lord of hosts, you who test the just, who probe mind and heart, let me witness the vengeance you take on them. For to you I have entrusted my cause. Sing to the Lord, praise his name. For he has rescued the life of the poor from the power of the wicked. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The psalm. In my distress, I called upon the Lord, and he heard my voice. In my distress, I called upon the Lord. I love you, O Lord, my strength, O Lord, my rock, my fortress, my deliverer. I am my distress, I call upon the Lord, and hear my voice. My God, my rock of refuge, my shield, the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. Praise be the Lord, I exclaim, I am safe from my enemies. In my distress, I call upon the Lord. The breakers of death surge round about me. The destroying floods overwhelmed me. The cords of the netherworld enmeshed me. The snares of death overtook me. In, In my distress, distress I call upon the Lord, and he heard my voice. In my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried out to my God. From his temple, he heard my voice and my cry to him reach his ears. In, in my distress, I call upon the Lord, and he hears my voice. The Lord be with you, and with your spirit, a reading from the Holy Gospel, according to St. John. Glory to you, Lord. The Jews picked up rocks to stone Jesus, Jesus answered them, I have shown you many good works from my Father. For which of these are you trying to stone me? The Jews answered him, We are not stoning you for good works, but for blasphemy. You, a man, are making yourself God. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, I say, you are God's? If it calls them gods to whom the word of God came, and scripture cannot be set aside, can you say that the one whom the Father has consecrated and sent into the world blasphemes because I said I am the Son of God? If I do not perform my Father's works, do not believe in me. But if I perform them, even if you do not believe in me, believe the works, so that you may realize and understand that the Father is in me, and I am in the Father. Then they tried again to arrest him, but he escaped from their power. He went back across the Jordan to the place where John first baptized. 
and there he remained. Many came to him and said, John performed no sign, but everything John said about this man was true, and many there began to believe in him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise you, Lord Jesus Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Since next Friday is Good Friday, and it's a whole different theme for the day when we gather in the evening to the Stations of the Cross, I'm going to complete our little journey through the book of Genesis this evening. Remembering now the book of Genesis, the beginning of the Bible, the beginning of the unfolding of God's plan. What plan? The plan of God to undo the sin of Adam and Eve that closed the gates of heaven. And God's plan would stretch from the moment of Adam and Eve's sin up until the resurrection of Christ and then take a different form and continue after that in the church. This was God's plan. And he reveals to us in his word and in his actions how he would accomplish his plan. And his plan involved working with and through a particular nation, Israel, that he chose, and individuals that he chose out of that nation. Prophets that he would speak to, like Moses, and give them a message to tell the people about and to record. Eventually, working through the people Israel to bring about salvation would find its fullness in the flower of all Israel's virtue, the Blessed Mother. She would be the ultimate one God would work through in order to accomplish his plan because through her his son would enter the world. And we learned about the book of Genesis that for tens of thousands of years, it was in oral form. It wasn't written, it was spoken. And the things that are in Genesis were talked about when the people would gather, when it was harvest time, they would go to particular places where there were outdoor altars set up. But when, what they had was not altars like this. They would just pile stones up. And this would be considered a holy place. Because what they would do, if it was harvest time, they would take sheep and sacrifice them there on those stones. Or they would take wheat, or they would take grapes and burn them as an offering to God on those stones. So these became very special type of holy place where they would gather. And when they gathered to offer their sacrifices, their gifts to God, they would sit down and the Levites and the rabbis would <coughs> tell them of the events that were in the book of Genesis. And the people would listen. And after the rabbis were done telling them, they would talk about it and try to understand, and try to figure out the meaning of each thing that happened. You're going to see that. Tens of thousands of years later, when our Lord came, when he taught the apostles, it tells us in the Gospels so often, the apostles and our Lord did the same thing. Our Lord taught them, and then afterwards, they would discuss it, and he would tell them the meaning of the different symbols, of the different events. And they would question him and try to get deeper into the meaning of what he was talking about. Well, so it happened with the Israeli 
the ancient Israelites, the rabbis, the prophets, would tell them of God's work, of God's deeds, of the people that God was working through, the prophets. They would tell them about them, and they would listen. And it was all they had to listen to. And they listened very seriously in order to understand God. We also remember that in the book of Genesis, it shows us that in choosing a people, in choosing Abraham and his son Isaac and his son Jacob and Jacob's 12 brothers, in choosing this people, this one tribe out of all the tribes that existed in the world at that time, God did not choose perfect people. He tried to choose good people, but they weren't perfect. And part of God's plan was to gradually perfect them, but it didn't happen all at once. There were some of the things that these people did, and even though they were chosen by God and they knew it, he tolerated some behavior in them because it wasn't his plan to change them all at once. You say, why? They wouldn't have survived. They lived in a very savage world. They lived in a very pagan world. And in order for them to survive, they had to be as tough as the people around them. So you're going to see in the book of Genesis and other book, book of Kings in the Old Testament, you're going to see they would go to war. And when they went to war, they were pretty mean. They were pretty cruel when they went to war. You know, how did God allow that? Well, if they were like pacifist, soft-spoken people, they wouldn't have lasted. So they had to be as tough as their neighbors. And God tolerated it. I'll fix it later. But we also know in the book of Genesis, there were things going on of, of a nature that would today be considered immoral. And later on, God will correct them and tell them, you're not going to do that anymore. The taking of multiple wives. And then when, when you get tired of them, you send them away. Go and take the children that you bore me with you. And as I mentioned last week, today you would go to jail for that, rightly. But God tolerated it, and eventually he would tell them, no, you're not going to do this anymore. No, one wife, not, not multiple wives. So we see God's tolerating the people that he chose. They weren't perfect. He's bringing them gradually along to perfection, but not all at once. You don't do violence to a person's nature. God gradually drew them to understand the wrongness of what they were doing, but he didn't force them. He didn't suddenly say, you're going to be a totally different person. There's nothing to be gained by that. Remember, if God wanted to do that, he would have made more angels. These were human beings. And from human beings, God wanted a free will response. So we saw also that the belief throughout the Old Testament, beginning in Genesis, that if I sin, the effect of my sin will affect people after me. Adam and Eve's sin affected their descendants after them. So they believed the sin of Jacob when he stole his brother's birthright. That would remain with him, and the effect of that sin would put a bad seed in his family because of what he had done. So when the story of what God had did and what these people did 
when the story was told and all the people were sitting around on the sand in the evening listening to the story, they would nudge each other. Oh, see, something bad happened to him. Yeah, see that? Remember, he stole his brother's birthright. See that? God, God got him for that. And this would be a thought that we're going to see again in the Gospels. It remained with Israel, this thought. You do something wrong, or your ancestor did something wrong, and the seed of that wrongness remains inside of you. And it's going to, it's going to get back at you. It's going to bite you because of what you did. So, in his old age, Jacob has 12 sons that are his prime sons. There were others. But these are the ones that he favored, these 12. And then at the end, the wife that he favored, Rachel, who never had any children, suddenly she has a child. And Jacob dotes on this child, spoils him. It's Joseph. The brothers have to work in the fields. The brothers have to tend the sheep. Joseph doesn't have to work. He stays home and eats Cheerios and watches cartoons. <laughs> and his mother makes him the coat of many colors, a very special way of dressing him, you know, like right out of the cleaners, while the brothers are out sweating and toiling in the field. And by doing that, now again, remember, the people are sitting around, they're listening to this sacred history being told to them. And when they see and they hear how Jacob favored one child over his other children, you're in trouble. Bad business to do that. That's going to bite you. That's not going to have a good ending when you do that. And sure enough, it doesn't. The 12 brothers hated Jacob. And last week, I, I found what I couldn't find in, in this Bible. Jacob sends Joseph to bring a message to his brothers. So Joseph went after his brothers and caught up with them in Dothan. They noticed him from a distance before he came up to them, and they plotted to kill him. They said to one another, here comes that master dreamer. Come on, let us kill him and throw him into one of the cisterns here. We could say that a wild beast devoured him. We shall then see what comes of his dreams. Joseph would come to the breakfast table and say, I had a dream last night, and in my dream, I was exalted high above all you working brothers. And in my dream, all of you served me. And in my dream, all of you bowed before me. He really added, you know, to the situation. He like poured oil on fire when he did that. When Reuben heard this, he tried to save him from their hands, saying, we must not take his life. Instead of shedding blood, he continued, just throw him into that cistern there in the desert, but do not kill him outright. His purpose was to rescue him and restore him to their father. So when Joseph came up to them, they stripped him of the long tunic he had on and then took him and threw him into the cistern, which was empty and dry. Cistern, uh, a, a, a pit lined with rocks, with a ledge, and when it held rainwater. This one was empty. They were deep, because if it was shallow, the sun would have evaporated the rainwater. So you wanted your cistern to be about 15 or 20 feet deep so the rainwater wouldn't evaporate. And this is one of my favorite lines in the Bible. They threw their brother 
by 15 or 20 feet to the bottom of a stone cistern. They then sat down to their meal. Was he hurt? His back broken? Was he bleeding? Was he dead? Was he alive? Remember I told you last week, sin. When we sin, we are usually so convinced that what we're doing is right and good and valuable that we lose all sense of judgment, all sense of right or wrong. We're impelled by the need that we express in the sin we commit. They ate their lunch. You could see them sitting on the rim of this cistern, opening up the aluminum foil and eating their sandwiches. The effect of sin. But again, those listening, oh, God will punish them. Oh, this, will, this will come back and bite them when you do stuff like that. Looking up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites from Gilead with their camels laden with gum, balm, and resin to be taken down in trade to Egypt. Judah said to his brothers, what is to be gained by killing our brother and concealing his blood? Rather, let us sell him to these Ishmaelites instead of doing away with him ourselves. Notice, just as an aside, there were 12 brothers. Each of them became the head of one of the 12 tribes of Israel. Each one of the 12 tribes would live in a different province of Israel. Two of the brothers, Reuben and Judah, tried to save Joseph. Later on in the Bible, that'll have a meaning. Because later on in the Bible, we're going to see 10 of the tribes were wiped out. 10 of the tribes were taken captive and brought to Babylon where they disappeared and they were no more. The only two tribes that survived were Reuben and Judah. Two survived, ten were wiped out. Oh, right. Well, they were the ones who tried to save Joseph. So you see, when you do something bad, and the badness affects in the future, when you do something good, the goodness affects in the future. So uh, the two tribes that weren't wiped out, Judah and Reuben. Sure, they tried to save the connection. They would have understood the connection right away. They tried to save Joseph. So what happens to Joseph? The Ishmaelites come and they, they buy Joseph and they give the brothers the money, the pieces of silver. Ooh, where are we gonna see that again? The price for a slave, they sold Joseph for silver. The brothers take the money, Joseph is sold, the Ishmaelites bring him down. They were traders, they always had caravans. They were another tribe. They bring him down to Egypt and they sell him to a very rich Egyptian. And it says, Joseph in his misery, and this is going to be another theme that is throughout the Bible. As miserable as he was, now remember, when they sold him to this Egyptian, the Egyptian did not buy him so that he could sit and watch cartoons and eat Cheerios. The Egyptian bought him so that he could work and work hard. But this was a kid who didn't work. This was a kid who had never been taught to work. So you could just imagine Life was especially miserable, hard, and unhappy for Joseph in Egypt. And Joseph is missing his father, he's missing his mother, and he's missing the good life. And 
is being made to work very hard and very cruelly. However, he does not lose his faith in God. He still believes he is part of God's plan and that God is watching over him. Even though these terrible things are happening to him, he doesn't lose faith in God. Another theme throughout the Bible that those who believe in God believe in him even when things are very bad, even when everything is against belief. They continue. They are loyal. They believe in God. So Joseph held on to his belief in God. The Egyptian to whom Joseph was sold had several wives. One of the wives took a liking to Joseph. Cute kid. And she came on to Joseph. Joseph, again, he believed in God. He wanted no part of this sin. And at one point, she goes after him and grabs him and he, as he's trying to run away from her. And she grabs him by the collar of his coat and he just lets himself out of the coat and runs off. And she's left holding the coat. And remember, they're sitting there listening to this story. Yeah, there's another thing with him and a coat wasn't there. The coat that his brothers dipped in blood and showed to their father and said an animal devoured him. Another coat, he slips out of it. And she's left holding his coat. But what she does, and this sounds like a soap opera, and again, they're all listening to this, and it's like another chapter in a soap opera. She turns around and she tells her husband, he came on to me, and in the struggle, I was left holding his coat, and, and he ran away. Her husband grows very angry and throws Joseph into prison. So you would say, things weren't bad enough for Joseph. Life wasn't hard enough. Now he's even found as a slave, and now he's in prison. And remember, we're talking about Egypt, and he had no influence, he was a slave. There's no trial date set. He, he can't say, uh, I want an attorney, I get to make two phone calls, nothing. You're thrown into prison, you're gonna rot there, Joseph. In prison, he meets two officials of the Pharaoh's court. God is at work. God's purpose is at work in his plan and in every part of his plan. So even this is going to be used by God as part of a plan. He meets two officials of the Pharaoh who had displeased the Pharaoh because the Pharaoh was troubled by dreams and these two officials could not give him a, a pleasing explanation for his dreams. Remember, these are all pagan people and they had pagan customs. And even Joseph, with his dreams, this was kind of like one of the pagan things that was going on in the world around him. What is it that psychologists tell us dreams are little snippets of reality that weren't put together properly in your head? It's kind of like bits and pieces of what you experience or people that you know, but it's just bits and pieces. They're not put together properly. And that's, these are dreams. <clears throat> so the ancient people, they were really into 
dreams and the interpretation of dreams, and they really thought that they could foresee the future and that the dreams, if you just knew how to interpret them, a message was being given to you, and if you knew how to interpret that message, later on God's going to say, he's tolerating this now, but later on, when God gives Moses the Ten Commandments, he would say, no, none of this, no one's giving you messages, you know, uh, it, that you have to interpret. If I have something to tell you, I'll tell you clearly. There was no message to be interpreted when the Archangel Gabriel came to the Blessed Mother. It was very clear. Uh, God has a, a, a thing for you to do. Will you do it? So Joseph, who was very much into this dream business, is talking to these two former officials of the Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and he's telling them, I know what these dreams mean. Uh, if, if I could only tell the Pharaoh, he would be pleased. And by the way, if you can get me to tell the Pharaoh, I'll get you out of jail too. So they arrange it. And Joseph is brought to the Pharaoh. And Joseph tells the Pharaoh, I will interpret your dreams. And in this sense, it does fit into God's plan because one of the things that he dreamt involved three branches, and Joseph says, that's three days. This will happen. It's a good thing. It's going to happen in three days. And so it did. And when it happened, Pharaoh sent for Joseph and the two officials that were also in prison and freed them. And Joseph was given a position in his court. And Joseph found Pharaoh to be a very pleasant boss. And they got along fine. And Joseph raises higher and higher in rank in Egypt. And he becomes more and more wealthy in Egypt. And at one point, Joseph becomes the manager of everything in Egypt. The king doesn't manage things himself, he's got a manager. Joseph was the manager of everything in Egypt. Nudge, nudge, and see he believed in God. He didn't give up, even though he was miserable, even though he ended up in jail. See that nudge, nudge? You, you don't give up on God, you continue to believe. Back in Israel, there's a famine. Does it rain enough? Maybe a worm was eating the crops. We don't know. There's a famine, and it lasted a long time. So old Jacob tells his sons, here, here's some money. Go down to Egypt. There's no famine there. Buy grain for us, and then come back. So the 12 brothers go down to Egypt. And according to the law in Egypt at the time, any grain that was exported had to be approved by the king's manager, Joseph. When the brothers go to the manager to get the approval, he recognizes his brothers right away. They don't recognize him at all. Why? Because he was a kid. It's maybe 10 years later. He's grown and he looks like an Egyptian and he's uh, speaking Egyptian and he's talking to them through an interpreter. And so they don't recognize him. He recognizes then, and it says, he turned his face to the side and cried, that he could see his brothers again. So in his heart, Joseph had forgiven his brothers. He was so happy to see them again. But he's going to test them. Joseph is going to give his brothers a little bit of a test. And 
They say our father was Jacob, we are 12 brothers, we are of the tribe of Jacob, and we've come here to buy grain, and then we're going to bring the grain home, and we're going to pay for it. It's going to be a very neat and clean deal. There's no problem. So Joseph tells them, are you just 12? Isn't there a younger brother? Nudge, nudge. See that? It's biting them. It's coming back. What they did, they're being punished for it, and they thought so too. We're being punished for what we did. And it said the brothers really weren't able to answer. They certainly weren't going to explain what they had done. And they weren't able to answer. They were silent. So Joseph said, you go back, leave me, one of your brothers. Go back and get the youngest one. And when you bring the youngest one, I'll let you buy all the grain that you want to buy. Brothers, we're finished. What are we going to do? How are we going to produce this youngest son? So they come back and they go with the grain. They come back to buy more. And Joseph reveals himself. And he says, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into slavery, but it was all part of God's plan. Come down now. Bring my father Jacob and come to Egypt where there is grain and grapes and fruit and meat enough, and you will live with me here in Egypt. So Jacob, and all his flocks and the 12 brothers all go down to Egypt to live there. And Jacob dies there. And Joseph dies there. And then it will say, there came a time when the new Pharaoh knew not Joseph and enslaved the foreigners, the Israelites who were living in Egypt. He made of them slaves. And the book of Genesis ends with that. They're enslaved. God had a plan. And God's plan involved his people being in one place. His people living in the world but being messengers for the world, but not participating in the sinful ways of the world. The whole purpose, some 50 years ago, there was a great theological movement in the church <clears throat> that would begin by saying, we are a pilgrim people on our way to heaven. Yes, ultimately, we are a pilgrim people on our way to heaven. But before we go to heaven, our pilgrimage takes us to the, the earthly Jerusalem, the place where God gathers his own, and they bear witness to God in the world. And their message of witness to God goes out to the whole world and they show the world what faith is about. It's called church. God's plan involves bringing together the people in one place together, safe, taught, nourished, growing in holiness. Remember, when God saved Noah and his children in the ark, his purpose was not the, that the ark is going to sail to heaven. He could have done that and said, good, I saved you. There was goodness. You people were worth saving. The ark did not sail up to heaven. The ark 
had a destination. And the destination was Mount Ararat in Armenia. And when the ark landed there, then the idea was, all right, now go out of the ark and live your belief in me there in the world. That's the purpose that I brought you here for. So we're going to leave Israel enslaved in Egypt at the end of the book of Genesis. All the time understanding God has a plan for these people. His plan can be temporarily <coughs> derailed when people don't cooperate. When people do not have the power to change God's plan. God's plan will be accomplished. We've already seen how sometimes to accomplish God's plan, it goes turning and turning and twisting, and it comes to the point where God wants it to come to. So the next book in the Bible is the book of Exodus. And it tells us how God's plan would not be confused. It would not be blocked. That even though, just like Joseph had reached rock bottom when he was in prison in Egypt, God will raise him up and his plan will be accomplished. Now the whole people, Israel, followed Joseph. The descendants of the 12 tribes, hmm, because of what they did, see, their suffering. They reach rock bottom, but God's plan in the book of Exodus would be to save them. The journey will continue. The journey is part of God's plan. It's where he teaches, but he brings us to one place. The place in this world is his church, where we are safe and nourished, taught and grow in holiness. This is our Catholic approach to the Bible. Um, it's not that each book gives us God in our back pocket. And it's not that as Catholics we take little quote from the Bible and say, oh, this is the answer to, to all, all your problems. No, that's not our approach. Our approach is this is the sacred history of God at work. And as we listen to it, think of the Israelites sitting on a blanket on the desert floor, listening to the rabbis, and every once in a while nudging the guy next to them. Wow, God is doing that. Wow, God is at work. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. Through your goodness we have received the bread we offer you. Fruit of the earth, work of human hands, it will become for us bread of life. Bless be God forever. By the mystery of this water and blood, may we come to share in the divinity of Christ, who humbled himself to share in our humanity. And blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for your goodness. We have received the wine. We offer you fruit of the vine, work of human hands. It will become our spiritual drink. Blessed be God. With humble spirit, contrite heart, may we be accepted by you, O Lord. May our sacrifice in your sight this day be pleasing to you, Lord God. Wash me, Lord, from my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin.
pray, brethren, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. Again, let us pray. Grant, O merciful God, that we may be worthy to serve ever fittingly at your altars and there to be saved by constant participation. And we ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with you your spirit. Lift up your hearts. You lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It, it is right and just. just. It is truly right and just, our duty, our salvation, always and everywhere, to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, Almighty, Eternal God, for through the saving passion of your Son, the whole world has received a heart to confess the infinite power of your majesty, since by the wondrous power of the cross, your judgment on the world is now revealed and the authority of Christ crucified. So, Lord, with all the angels and saints, we too give you thanks as in exaltation we acclaim Sanctus, 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 Dominus Deus Sabato, Plenis Interior Terra, Gloria Tua, Hosanna in Justice, Benedictus Quidemini, Hosanna in Justice. You are indeed holy, O Lord, the fount of all holiness. Make holy, therefore, these gifts we pray by sending down your spirit upon them like wizard fall, so that they may become for us body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. At the time he was betrayed and entered willingly into his passion, he took bread, giving thanks, he broke it, gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice, and once more giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you, for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. mystery of faith, we, we proclaim the Lord, the resurrection, Therefore, as we celebrate the memorial of his death and resurrection, we offer you, Lord, bread of life, chalice of salvation, giving thanks that you have held us worthy to be in your presence and minister to you. Humbly, we pray, partaking of the body and blood of Christ, we may be gathered into one by the Holy Spirit. And remember, Lord, your church spread throughout the world. Bring her to the fullness of charity 
together with Francis Elwood Pope, John Elwood Bishop, all the clergy. Remember brothers and sisters fallen asleep in hope of resurrection, all who died in your mercy, welcome them into the light of your face. Have mercy on us all, we pray, that with Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, Blessed Joseph, her spouse, Blessed Apostles, the saints who pleased you throughout the ages, we may merit to be co-heirs to eternal life and may praise and glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him, with him, in him, God, Almighty Father, in unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory, all honor is yours forever and ever. Amen. At the Savior's command, formed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and I will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, and we forgive those who trespass us. And it is not a Deliver us, Lord, we pray from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin, safe from all distress, as we await blessed hope, the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom and the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church. Graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And, and with you your spirit. spirit. Anus Dei, we be told as de Catamundi, misere nobis. Anus Dei, we be told as de Catamundi, misere nobis. Anus Dei, we be told as de Catamundi, don't have this passion. Behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I O body of Christ, keep me safe for eternal. For eternity. Amen.
after Mass, I'll place the Blessed Sacrament on the altar where it will remain for your private prayer until 8.30, and we'll have benediction at 8.30. If you would wish to do your First Friday devotions to the Sacred Heart, I think the books are still in the back. Yes, so just you take the book and then you put it back when you're done. But uh, you could do your First Friday devotions during that period, or you could wait until next Friday, but it'll be Good Friday. Uh, there'll be other things going on. So anyhow, privately, if you wish to do your devotions, the books are in the back. Let us pray. May the unfailing protection of the sacrifice we have received never leave us, O Lord, and may it always drive far from us all that would do us harm. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.